Greetings, my name is Turdin and I talk about the lore and history of various games and other things I like. Now, I know what I'm about to say might be a bit of a spicy take, but the samurai are awesome. From their weaponry, to their gorgeous armor, to the plentiful shenanigans and stories that sound like they come right out of Game of Thrones, they are by far one of, if not my favorite historical thing ever. From humble horse archers, to battle-hardened warriors, to cultured nobles, they have changed a lot over the years. And I could make multiple videos just about what it truly really meant to be a samurai throughout the ages. In fact, I might, because I do love to talk, and I do also love me some samurai, but I digress. But it's not just their position in society or on the battlefield that have changed and adapted throughout history, but also the tools they used to fight on said battlefield with. From the box-like Domaru armor and Tachi longsword, to the more sleek and modern-looking Tose Guzoku and ever-famous Katana. Some things or tools might have largely stayed the same, but most things had to adapt sooner or later, preferably sooner when an army of angry samurai are threatening to kick your door down and turn you into sashimi. Nothing speeds up one's ability to stab things more effectively than 160 years of civil war, as it turns out. And it is this chaotic period of samurai punch-ups, better known as the Sengoku Jidai, that saw the introduction of arguably one of the most significant pieces in weaponry in samurai warfare, the Tanegashima Teppo, or Matchlock Arquebus. Now, most people have a rather static view on the definition of what is and isn't honorable behavior to the samurai, and thanks to a lot of pop culture depictions of them, uh, for many the use of guns falls neatly into the very bad shameful display category. But the thing that some people might not think about though, is that the samurai were a culture and people that were around for a very long time, very long ago and on the other side of the world. What they viewed as honorable was nowhere near what we think it was, and it was a lot more than just a more weeby version of chivalry, which is already very mythologized and so intertwined with fiction that it's difficult to discern what is and isn't true. For many samurai, being honorable just meant being willing to die in the name of your lord, and bringing him plenty of glory and riches in the process. If the use of firearms made such a thing possible, then so be it. Yes, there were undoubtedly a few samurai who were against the use of guns on the battlefield, but a lot of them did truly love their shooty sticks. Or at least they did eventually, and allow me to elaborate a bit on that. So anyway, let's not delay any further and get into the history, development, rise, and eventual fall of the Tanegashima Teppo. Hmm. Ooh. So our story begins during a dark night in 1543, where a Chinese merchant ship was caught in a particularly nasty storm and was forced to make an emergency stop on the island of, wait for it, Tanegashima, off the coast of southern Kyushu. This ship just so happens to have a few Portuguese traders aboard, who were more than happy to sell the local lord of the island, a fine fellow by the name of Tanegashima Tokitaka, some of their goods, among which were two Portuguese snap matchlocks. Now, this was right in the middle of the turbulent and incredibly violent Sengoku Jidai, or Age of Warring States, so any tool that makes you better at removing your fellow humans from the picture was more than appreciated. So Tokitaka immediately put his best smiths on the task of replicating these little gadgets. But as it turns out, firearms, even early ones, are a bit more complicated than they look and he had some trouble figuring the damn things out. Which caused Tokitaka to go back to his new Portuguese trader besties and ever so politely ask them to maybe sort of kind of help him out a bit here. But unfortunately for him, some shipwrecked Portuguese traders know just as much about constructing guns as Redditors do about, well, anything they talk about, so they couldn't help him out much, but they promised to maybe see if they could find someone who could nearby and take them to Tokitaka. And they actually did, as about a year later they would return to the island with a gunsmith in tow, who would teach Lord Tokitaka's smiths all about how to produce, assemble and work the bang bang sticks. From here on out, many more guns began to be produced, sold and distributed all over the place. And another weapon with murderous potential was added to a period that really didn't need any more of them, but was most appreciated nonetheless. Now, this is where we tackle another myth some people have about the use of guns in feudal Japan, or even of early firearms in general. That being that guns were an immediate upgrade to bows and took their place in warfare the second they were introduced. And this isn't exactly true. Guns weren't inherently superior, at least at first. They were just different. You see, while the samurai had been introduced to the pointy bang death sticks, it still took some time before their use on the battlefield was truly realized and reached its maximum potential. Early firearms had plenty of downsides and weren't exactly the most flexible weapons to use in the best of times. 
While it is easier to teach and learn how to use a gun over a bow, they are also a lot more difficult and expensive to make. I don't mean to undersell people who make bows or practice with them, but at the end of the day it's just a piece of wood with some strings attached. Compare that with a matchlock rifle which has all sorts of complicated tomfoolery going on, as showcased with how some of Lord Tokitaka's best smiths couldn't even manage to reproduce them without being taught by someone who did. Not to mention that by the time the Sengoku Chidai broke out, bows had been used for hundreds of years in Japan by that point, and you had a lot more skilled bowyers kicking about the place than you did experienced gunsmiths. And you also have the issue with your rate of fire and reloading times. A bow can theoretically fire non-stop until ammunition runs out. Even if you completely mess up your shot or need to take some time to aim, you can get a new arrow on the string in no time. But with the Teppo it wasn't so easy. Even the most experienced of gunners could only reload so quickly under pressure and would only be able to fire a shot every 30 seconds to a minute or so. Which might not sound like much, but it's a long time on the battlefield. If you missed your shot you'd be pretty screwed as by the time you were able to try again, the person you were shooting at could have already closed the distance or managed to not mess up their shot. Now obviously that isn't to say that bows were the superior ones here. Again, I don't think one was necessarily better than the other at first, they were just different. The tempo was a lot more lethal for one and more accurate for the other. You didn't have to worry as much about the direction of the wind when using a tempo as you did when using a bow, as your shot would usually just shoot straight at the direction you pointed it at given that you didn't mess up things too much. And while bows were a lot stealthier, firearms were the complete opposite side of the coin. Turns out that loud noises and smoke can deal quite a psychological hit on your opponent. Surprisingly, it's pretty spooky when the castle walls suddenly erupt with explosions and your comrades start falling over dead around you. Not to mention that firearms had way more armor piercing capabilities than arrows did. And even the earliest types of tepo used by the samurai were capable of blowing a hole in most pieces of armor. However, the thing that would eventually see the tempo beat the bow in this arms race was the fact that, as seen with modern guns today, firearms had a lot more potential left to grow than bows did. Over time, the samurai managed to figure out and learn all sorts of neat tricks to lessen and sometimes even completely negate the tempo's downsides, while the bow was in a pretty static place development-wise. For example, in order to lessen the issue with reloading times, the samurai began making use of tepotai, or gun units, which would fire off in turn and have one rank or group reload while the other made their shots, thus managing to keep the pressure up and prevent anyone from closing the gap too much. Lacquerware boxes began being produced that could be used to shield the firing mechanism from bad weather, allowing the tepo to be fired even while it was raining. And they also began using these nifty little things called a Hayago, which was a bamboo tube with powder and a bullet already inside. All one had to do was open it up, pour the contents into your gun, give it a good ramen and you'd be good to go, which served as a massive improvement in the ways of speeding up the whole reloading process. These bamboo tubes could even be reused and repackaged afterwards. And say what you want about the samurai, but they got their recycling game down before it was cool. And just when you thought the improvements would slow down, the Japanese smiths flexed their 300 engineering skill in WoW a bit and began tinkering with the tempo in all sorts of fun ways, giving them a bit more power, upping their efficiency and producing several variants with their own specific uses. Some examples include the Ozutsu, which was a lot bigger, meaner and packed enough of a punch to be used to break open doors, or the Zamazutsu, which had a longer barrel and was often used by a crew of two gunners due to their larger size, which thought particularly excel at firing from defensive locations like castles, ships or fortifications. With all these new improvements and upgrades, their use in battle became a lot more common, showcased especially in the famous Battle of Nagashino between the Oda and Takeda in 1575, where the Oda were set to have had 3000 gunners on the field. By coordinating between the several tepotai and firing in turn, they managed to hold back and make short work of the famous Takeda cavalry. In the end, the Takeda would lose between 3000 and 10,000 lives in the battle. And while those numbers can be a bit iffy, what isn't iffy is that several of the Takeda's top generals were among those killed, which was a massive blow to the Takeda no matter how many men they ended up actually losing. This really served as a massive turning point in the use of the tepo, and it made clear just how much potential these fun little gadgets really had. In fact, it's even been said and theorized that Japan might have had more matchlocks at some point than the entirety of Europe did. Which, if true, should tell you something about just how much the samurai fell in love with these little metal sticks of death and the noble art of pointing them at one another. And unfortunately for everyone who wasn't them, the samurai didn't just stick at pointing them at one another. 
During the invasion of Korea near the end of the Sengoku Jidai, the samurai would use a lot of guns. With one of the Japanese commanders even sending a letter back home saying that there was no use for spears. And to ask those back home to arm as many soldiers leaving for Korea with guns as was possible. The bows and the relatively primitive hand cannons used by the Koreans were of little use against the well-trained and coordinated firing lines of the samurai. And while they would eventually lose the war due to a certain very swell fellow, it definitely wasn't because of their lack of firepower, or at least on land. However, unfortunately for the Teppo, once the turbulent Sengoku Jidai had wrapped up a bit, and the more peaceful Edo period was on the horizon, they would fall into disuse. A weapon meant to shoot people is a bit less useful when there is no one to shoot it at, and what little conflicts or disagreements did break out were usually resolved with a quick sword to the sensitive bits. Outside of hunts, martial arts like hojutsu, competitions and perhaps the occasional bits of self-defense were appropriate, most depot would be left to gather dust in the armories for the next 200 or so years. As did a lot of other weapons and armor since all that not fighting each other and peace business didn't do much favors to the classic elite warriors look of the samurai. And when the US of A forcibly opened the country back open to trade, and perhaps some casual exploitation and possible colonialism <coughs> in 1853, things really did go completely south for the good old Teppo. Japan hadn't been keeping very up to date with the rest of the world due to the fact that they had completely closed the country during most of the Edo period, and while the samurai had stopped pointing shooty sticks at one another, the rest of the world hadn't, and had gotten pretty darn good at it too. The modern rivals that the western traders brought with them were superior in almost every single way to the old-fashioned matchlocks that were still used in Japan at that moment. They had more killing power, quicker reloading times, more range, and were even more lethal to armor than regular matchlocks were. Not to mention all the other fun toys like modern artillery pieces or gatling guns that made the tempo even more obsolete. After all that, the last time the Teppo would be used in any real quantity was in 1877 during the Satsuma Rebellion. But unlike what you might think after watching The Last Samurai, this was only because the rebels had run out of ammo for their actual arrivals and stuff, and were forced to turn to the old reliables like spears, bows and, wait for it, matchlock arquebuses. These samurai were more than on board with modern weaponry, but if you don't have any ammo left to fire them, but you do have a spear to hand, I think it's quite obvious what most people would do. However, this had... Uh, predictable results. And the Satsuma Rebellion was basically shot down to the last man. A valiant last stand that made all Tokitaka weep proud tears from the afterlife, but not really the best tactical decision in the history of warfare. And thus concluded the reign of the Tanegashima Teppo, arguably one of the more significant weapons of samurai warfare, which completely turned the tactics of the time on its head. Its use shaped the history of the period in more ways than one, yet it still remains a very overshadowed weapon. A lot of people still think that having the audacity to use a shooty shooty pointy dang death bang bang stick was a horrible horrible thing for which you should feel very guilty. Instead, endlessly fawning over the katana like it's some sort of mythical blade of the sun goddess Amaterasu herself. And I mean, hey, fair enough, the katana is gorgeous. And I'm not ashamed to admit that it looks kick-ass. But it's still kind of a shame. I'm not a gun nut, but as far away from one as you could probably get. But I think there should be credit where credit is due. The Tanegashima Teppo might not be the first weapon people think of when they think of feudal Japan, but as many dead samurai could probably attest to, it made quite the impact. Now if you're still here, thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed today's topic, maybe consider liking or subscribing if you'd want to see more. If you have a topic you'd like me to discuss or you just want to actually me, you can let me know in the comments. And if you want to see some of the minis I paint or watch me simping over dwarfs, you can check out my social link down below. If you want to learn more about the use of firearms in feudal Japan, and even see some of them in practice, might I suggest checking out Gun Samurai? He's part of the Matsumoto Castle Gun Corps, and still practices with actual Tanegashima Teppo regularly. His channel will be linked in the description, and I definitely recommend giving him a watch. I hope you spent the day practicing Bushido, or doing something that makes you happy, and bye bye Of course, before recording, you always need to uh, enjoy your... Recording stop waffle. And you've a cup of coffee to go along with it. <coughs> Fuck.